divided between being a teacher, an electrician for Exxon, and a carpenter. And um, the guy can do dang near anything. Um, but he needed the space to, to tinker. He was giving up his shop, so we bought him a shop and built it on the property. And, you know, that was, uh, that was all part of the process. So they're living in the living room, um, like I said, that we carved out for them. That is their sovereign space. That is, we, you know, we treat that as their space for the time being while they have it. Um, but with that, you know, being the, the adding in the prepper element to it, the other thing I'll say is, um, you know, they have their own preps as well. So beans, bullets, and rice, you know, they're, they're adding their preps to our stores as well. Um, I think that's, that's an important part of being, you know, doing this whole community thing or homestead thing with, with them and having multi-generation someone that, you know, we're, we're basically marrying the families together and committing to do life together no matter what. Um, and then the, the, the other benefit to, to generational homesteading is that you have built-in help. Um, Laura and I don't have kids. We were not successful in that. And uh, so... For the longest time, it's just been her and I. It's her and I doing everything. And uh, but with with them on site, with them on property now, we have additional support. They're taking care of the animals this week, so Laura and I can be here together. Um, Laura and, and my mother-in-law split the responsibilities of cooking dinner, and uh, we eat dinner together as a family. Uh, that's a that's an important thing for us, no matter what we're doing. That's how, you know, that's, that's what we do is, is we spend time together in the evenings and talk about our day and just enjoy each other and try and strengthen that relationship. And that's the next thing is, you know, it's not just a matter of taking what is, it's, it's, it's growing it. It's, it's building a deeper relationship with, uh, um, you know, with our in-laws. So if you're going to do this, and I know, I know there's a few folks here that are, that are taking on something like this or that have kind of a generational homestead is, um, you know, deepen those relationships because they're going to be your first line when you need support, when you need help. And with our in-laws being, with my in-laws basically being in their 80s, um, that help is, is going to come faster than, or that need for help is going to come faster than, than, say, someone my age in our 40s or 50s, you know. So um, we understand that we're taking on that responsibility of supporting them when they get to that stage of life, kind of more towards the end of life. Um, my father-in-law acts like he's in his 50s right now, so I don't consider him into life yet. He's probably got another 10 years if, if he'll let him, if God will let him. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, when we, we understand that when it gets to that point, um, we're going to be there to, we're going to be their primary support. We're going to be their primary caretakers. We're going to, we're going to handle all of those things. Um, I guess the next one that I kind of skipped over is scheduling. You know, uh, everybody's got a different schedule that they want to keep. Um, and, and they're no different. So, so we had to also marry their schedule into ours is kind of the other thing that I wanted to touch on. Um, you know, they've got their medical appointments. They've got their, you know, their things that they want to do. As soon as we get back, they're, they're on their way to Colorado for a week. Um, so it's, it's little things like that. You know, it's, it's the little things that you don't think about that you, that you just assume um, that when you take on a, 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 it's not a burden, when you take on a responsibility like this, when you take on, um, joining multiple families together on the same property you have to look for those little things you have to be intentional about looking for those little things that can cause big problems um, they start out as small stuff and they can turn into big things pretty quick so it's looking for those little things that that matter and um, just managing them in the moment um 
Yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much it. I I uh, anybody got any questions? I knew you would, buddy. What you got, Tag? Yes. Great question. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Okay. So the question Tag asked is, um, my in-laws are going to pass away someday. We're going to pass away someday. So what's the next step for our property? Because we don't want to give it over just to give it to the government, right? Why would we do that? No. Next step for us, because we don't have kids, is I'm already in talks with my brother, with my brothers back home in Texas and their kids. And we're looking at turning, we will, we, we have not done it yet, but we are going to put our property into a trust. And it will be a family trust that, uh, that both my brother's families and their kids have access to as well as, as others if, if, you know, it ends up doing that. We're not sure about her sister. So we'll leave that one out of this for now. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's the plan is uh, we're going to, we are going to put it in a trust. We are going to, uh, to talk, continue the conversation with my brothers and their kids and uh, look into making it a, uh, you know, continuing that generational property. And if in the future we, we buy or are blessed and fortunate enough to buy additional property, we will do the same thing. It will go into a trust and uh, make it, you know, make it generational for the whole family. Great question. Thank you. Anybody else? What you got? So uh, to repeat the question, what Tag asked is um, uh, how much time did, did uh, Yaya and I put into uh, the infringement upon the freedom and the space that we already have? And I would say we talked about it probably six or seven months privately before we started planting the seed and, and introducing the idea to uh, her parents six years ago. Um, and since then, that desire just grew and grew and grew. So by the time things played out the way they did last summer, it was a no-brainer. It was already, you belong here, we need you here. But it's a great question and a great point because you do need to put a lot of thought and a lot of energy into what does it mean to really do that, right? Where are the boundaries? Where, how are you going to benefit each other? Um, they didn't want to be a burden. So, you know, it wasn't just us offering space to them. It was also them being willing to do it and them looking for opportunities and ways to participate. So I think that's a big part of the, um, uh, the relationship side of it as well, is you need to be, you need to be, they need to be intentional about, okay, how are we going to benefit this homestead that we're going to, we're potentially looking at, at joining or moving into? You're marrying families. You're committing to to taking on, uh, you know, someone that you really have no responsibility for in the grand scheme of things um, and making them and their well-being and then their future your responsibility. And so they need to be intentional about how they're going to be a benefit and they're going to be supporting of the activities or the things that have to get done on that homestead. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. How are you, Terry?
Okay. Okay. So yeah. So, so Terry, who you, you said it was your sister. I have two sisters and two brother-in-laws. They might live. Okay. Okay. So, so t Terry's sister and brother-in-law, I guess, bought the land next to them, and they're starting to develop it, and there's some contention over ownership or responsibilities of the land and that sort of thing. If I got that right, just to try and summarize it. Um, buddy, I think the best thing I can recommend for you is invite all of them to come out here and have a conversation with Callie because Callie figured it out and she's from England too. I guarantee you she probably had some words of wisdom for them. That'd be my recommendation. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Well, I'll pass it back to Spags. We'll go to the next Okay. All right. So I guess I'm giving away a Moore knife. Uh, this is a Moore Consball, and it is serialized. Let's see. This is what number number nine, right? Number no. I'm sorry. Eyes are bad. Number six. So it is number six. This is number six. It uh, it was uh, produced by I believe uh, Harrison Shooter Supply, and it has the Midwest Preparedness logo for this camp out for this festival. Uh, there is one of or there is only ten of these produced. This is number six of those ten. So I, I'd get to figure out who to give it to. Okay, let's see who we're going to give it to. I'm going to give it to Barb. Hey. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming. Okay. All right, and also on these knives, it was tagged from Life Done Free that purchased these knives as a sponsorship, and he's given the five knives to the speakers today to give out into the crowd. So maybe come up with some good questions, and you'll win the next one. So the next speaker that we have is Indiana Mike. He is uh, very involved in the local community here, and he is going to talk to you about that very topic. So give it up to Indiana Mike, please. Say what you can do with your three minutes. <laughs> Pour concrete. <laughs> so my topic is on the community advantage. Uh, show of hands if you feel like it. The camera's not facing you, so nobody's going to know. How many of y'all are currently part of a, what you would consider a community? Okay. How many of you all are searching for said community? All right. A few hands. So this message is primarily going to be for y'all and then for also people that have their community, uh, how to reflect on your experience and maybe make that a little bit better. Uh, I'd like to start out kind of on our journey, talking about specifically where our community, uh, where we started to figure out the community advantage. So we came from uh, our background uh, and we settled in Indiana. And in Indiana, we did not have community in the sense of what most of y'all have raised your hands and acknowledge that you have here. All right, it was my wife and I and some family members. Uh, we spent holidays together, but that was about it. And uh, we were off to a good start, right? We had a garden, we had chickens, we had enough storage for things, but we really didn't understand the community advantage. One of the first uh, situations that we ran into is we went ahead and did what, you know, every homesteader, I guess, is trying to do, and we got a wood stove, right? Well, there's a lot that goes into getting a wood stove more than just buying the thing and having it put in. you got to get firewood. For us, we didn't have the community advantage. We didn't know, like, hey, maybe you want to think about buying some land that's got some trees on it, right? So our property had some. If it was an emergency, I could knock them down and I can get some firewood. There was some within close proximity that I could scrounge up if I needed to. However, you know, for me, knocking down a tree at that point was a daunting process. I had never done it before. I had never really run a chainsaw at any extent. Uh, I remember the first time picking up a big, a big round and going, how in the world am I going to move this thing around, let alone split it, right? So that was kind of the first eye-opening experience. And, hey, it may not be as easy as you think. Uh, our garden was really good. If you guys have met my wife, you would know that she is the type of person that likes to have stuff in precise, regimented form, right? 
So our garden, perfect squares or rectangles for the raised garden beds. They were evenly spaced apart. There was cardboard down the center, and it was perfectly mulched, and she was using the one-foot gardening method. So it, the thing was precise. However, what we didn't realize at the time was the amount of work and effort that was going to be required to put that together. So we literally had to scrounge up uh, topsoil. We had to scrounge up compost, and we did all of that. And I'm not even joking. I picked up several 14-foot dump trailers of this material, and I hand wheelbarrowed every single ounce of those gardens into those beds, right? And my trailer was 100 yards away from where my beds were. So several dump trailer loads later, I thought to myself, well, I wish somebody would have told me about that. Well, now I knew, right? But I didn't have the community advantage to go see how somebody else had done it in real time and realize what, you know, the decision we were making maybe could have been a little bit more efficient. Uh, we had another instance where we started gathering firewood and we were getting on a good clip and I needed a lean-to right off the back of the pole barn that was on the property. I didn't have extensive construction background and I could see this lean-to in my mind. It was extremely simple. You know, pole barn's about 50 feet long. I just need some tin hanging off the back to stick my firewood under. But I couldn't wrap my head around it. So I hired an Amish crew to come in. This Amish crew, it took them all of two days to complete this, this dang lean-to. And I got done looking at it and I said, man, I probably could have done that if I would have had a little bit of guidance. But there's no video on YouTube that says, hey, here's how your pole barn is designed. Here's how you need to incorporate this lean-to. Now go do it, right? Because my pole barn was not constructed with what people would call a header across the top to hold all the trusses in. There was some sketchiness going on, but the Amish guy that had been doing this for a while walked in and said, I've seen this a million times, and it took him two days, and they got it pro uh, that problem solved with uh with no drama and i had a lean to what i learned from that was yeah i can pay for it but i could have done it for probably half the cost it would have taken me a little bit longer but now that energy capital that i just invested in that lean to i'm not going to be able to invest in firewood to put under my lean to right and then we begun to have some some revelations i guess about community uh, we met a couple uh, veterinarian friends through various channels and uh the wife in particular had this superpower. She was able to talk to my wife and push her into this uncomfortable zone of taking risk. <laughs> so the first endeavor was, Check it out hey, picture. you might want to go ahead and get some chickens. And my wife resisted. She said, I'm not ready for chickens. I don't know how to take care of chickens. I've never had chickens before. But her name, her name is Veronica. Veronica basically said, don't be a wuss. Go get chickens. And when you have a problem, call me. So off we were to Tractor Supply to go get a half dozen chickens for the first time, figuring it out. And if y'all don't know, chickens are the gateway farming drug, I guess. They're like the goldfish of the animal kingdom. Once you get chickens, you're not turning back. The chicken math, right. So this actually spurred on some confidence, which was great, because now we realized, you know what? Chickens are they are just little dinosaurs running around. They eat whatever, and they poop out breakfast. So it was easy, right? Chickens are not difficult. Our chickens ran into some problems. Uh, we lost one, but big deal, right? We learned a lot through that experience. That spurred us on to build the confidence for the next thing. You know, my wife and Veronica got together, and her husband's name is, uh, is Justin, and Justin and I were always sitting back going, well, what are they going to come up with next? So the next idea they had was meat chickens, right? We went from having a half dozen chickens to my wife and Veronica grinning across the table at us going, hey, we just ordered... 65 meat chickens figure it out we had no chicken tracker we had no chicken experience but at the same thing happened uh justin and veronica basically said hey we'll help you out however we can if you guys have questions call us we're a phone call away and when it comes time to processing don't stress over it this is the equipment we need we'll help you invest in it and we are going to come over and help you process chickens and they did that so within uh a couple of months, lo and behold, we've got 60 chickens ready to process, and here's Justin, Veronica, and a friend they brought in tow, and over the course of an eight-hour day, we processed all 60-something of those birds. In fact, I just had one for dinner last night, and this was two years ago. So if you want to know how to process a chicken, put it in your freezer and have it last a long time, come and talk to me, but uh, it worked really well. So... Oh, perfect. So there's a chicken processing uh, workshop going on at the end of the day tomorrow? Yeah, with Billy from Farmer Pasture Farms and uh, Derek from Hacks and Hope for the Homestead. Perfect.
Perfect. So we got Billy and uh, Hax coming out to do that chicken processing uh, workshop for you all as well. So that was just a basically a small preview of what community meant to us. And I really didn't understand what it meant uh, until I came out to my first experience with community. And that was visiting Tag's place. And they were having a community firewood day. So the amount of firewood that was processed that day is mind-boggling, right? He had knocked down a pond, you know, plowed over half the Cleveland National Forest or whatever, and it was all sitting out where his pond, you know, where his pond right in front of where his pond is at. And here comes a trove of people showing up and pickup trucks and chainsaws and wood splitters. And I had never processed a full tree in my life, so I didn't quite know what to expect. You know, I can pick up heavy stuff and I can put it down and I can move it around. So I felt, you know what, I'll be somewhat helpful. Uh, this looks like it's going to be a ton of work. But what I came to realize was, although it was a ton of work, everybody was running around smiling for the most part, having a good time, just sawdust and smiles flying everywhere, right? And at the end of the day, there were dump trailers full of split wood, IBC tote cages full of split wood, and they were ready to go for how long? So 13 and a half cords of wood in seven hours, which... For a group of people coming together, not looking for any kind of paycheck or nothing, just wanting to fellowship together, we had a wonderful meal. Everybody was smiling. I left at the end of that day, buck tired, wore out with a big old smile on my face. So that was my first dive into community. And I went home and told my wife all about it. And I said, you know what? I talk way too much. So you need to go out there on your own and experience it for yourself so you can form your own opinion because this is a huge step. Because granted, back in Indiana, we were situated. We had what we thought was figured out. We were, we were good to go, right? So in order for us to move, we were going to have to basically fold down an entire homestead, stuff it in the back of multiple U-Haul trucks, and ship it all the way out here, right? And that was a daunting task to even think about because we had spent years preparing that particular piece of property for us. So if you really want to begin to understand the power of community, think about this. Y'all remember the guy I told you about that couldn't build a lean-to? only a couple paragraphs ago, well, this dumb dumb decides, hey, I'm going to build a house, right? <laughs> if y'all know anything about Tag, he's the ultimate cheerleader, right? You can do it. It's easy. All mistakes are recoverable. So Tag and I go round and round about those particular sayings, and I do agree with them 90% of the time, and there's some stuff that I disagree on, uh, such as building a foundation. You can't mess that up. At least I can't, can't afford to, to screw up a foundation, right? So I hired that part out. Uh, I also thought I was right, and I said, hey, I'm just going to build with nails because science says nails. So I went with nails. I paid that price. So <laughs> that experience tax was horrible because I had to go back through and make some adjustments, right? But instead of just taking the screw out of the board and putting it back in, you know, you got to get a Sawzall involved and a pry bar and so on and so forth. So I learned that experience tax through community, and I should have listened, but I'm grateful that I learned that lesson. So the day comes for our build day. And I don't want to make anybody have any false dreams or false hopes. Building is, it can be easy, okay? But we put a lot of time and effort into learning uh, from TAG how to use uh, SketchUp and how to sketch our house and put our ideas down on paper. You know, we reached out to Kevin for some advice on, hey, we want to put up this header or we want to put this ridge beam in. We need to know uh, how do we do this and who can we talk to to make that, that goal achievable for us because that's a little bit out of my reach. So we went from, you know, I went from barely being able to comprehend how to build a lean-to to having that confidence through community to build a house. So we are now at the stage where we're getting closer and closer to that. We're a year into our build, and we're pretty far along. And it's going to come uh, to fruition, right? And that guy that couldn't build a lean-to is going to build a house. But there's absolutely no way that we would have done that without community. <laughs> And that's kind of the momentum that I want to carry forward. I want to help push others to have that same confidence and that same ability. I want to make sure that people understand if they put in the, the time, the effort, and the hard work that there are people within communities that are more than willing to step up and help you. That doesn't mean that they are going to drop everything they're doing, bring everything that they own, and put it at your doorstep and, and make it happen for you. What that means is that with your appropriate amount of effort and your appropriate amount of energy capital investment 
there will be people, there are people willing to stand next to you side by side and help you succeed. So, if anybody wants to experience what it's like to be part of a community, we've recently become, I would say, mildly active in our county because there's been some changes that were proposed in the middle of the day when we were, you know, the average person is at work trying to pay their tax bill. The government was having a meeting saying, hey, we want to drop our minimum acreage requirement from 20 acres down to three, right? What that effectively does is that opens up all this agricultural land around us to subdevelopment. That is not conducive to homesteading necessarily. There are areas that people can buy a piece of property and have their five acre little ideal YouTube homestead, and that is great. That is totally productive. But when you start to plop those things down into areas that don't have the resources and the infrastructure to support them, like where we're at, that becomes a problem. Last year we experienced uh, a pretty decent drought, and that drought almost sent us into water restrictions. But yet our county thinks it's a good idea to let people build houses all up and down these roads that can't even support any more water meters. Our neighbors have drilled wells. They're not getting water, right? They're having to haul their water in. So at some point, us as a community decided, like, hey, there needs to be some logic put back into this decision-making process. That's where we've kind of bonded together. So if you guys want to experience what's that, what that is like, we are actually attending a meeting this evening, and you guys are more than welcome to enjoy, uh, to come out and, and see that experience. And all you got to do is dip your toe in. You ain't even got to get all the way in. You just got to show up and see what it's like. So I want to extend that invitation out to you all. If you're interested, uh, come and find me after the presentation, and I'll be more than happy to give you info on that. So I'd like to now give away uh, the Mora knife. And the way that I would like to do this is I would like somebody to ask me a question that inspires the rest of this group and makes people think. And whoever has the most inspirational question amongst the group that causes people to think, uh, I think we should give, go ahead and give that knife to that person. And tag's excluded. He's already had his question. You can have the question. But... He doesn't get to win his own knife, though. No, no. That's against the rules. <laughs> Unless he's one of your county commissioners. <laughs> Isn't it funny how bureaucracy extends to the Midwest Preparedness Project? <laughs> hey, a couple things. You know, I was part of your guys' adventure, and there was two parts that really stood out to me that I think you should talk about because I think they're just so powerful. Talk about Jeanette coming down and her experiences, because they were vastly different than yours, right? And then um, also, when we started the build on your house that day, which, by the way, for anybody who hasn't experienced it, it might be the single greatest community experience of my life, because there was so much going on, it was so fast, but talk about the whirlwind. Because I, I, to me, that was just so powerful to watch the look on your guys' face. I knew it was going to be okay, but you didn't. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. We did not know for certain it was going to be okay. And I can't speak for Jeanette. She would have to be here to tell this story uh, from her perspective. But we sent her out, and she wound up uh, meeting up with uh, Grumpy and Grumpy Acres and Yoda and Garen, and they got together and processed chickens, right? Uh, and that was a great experience for her because that was a, a knowledge set that she hadn't quite picked up on yet that she wanted to expand on. And they took the time out of their schedule to teach back to her and didn't ask anything in return. Well, on her way down to go do this chicken processing, uh, she wound up going down a minimum maintenance road while it was raining in a little tiny car and getting stuck. So luckily for her, she's somewhat prepared. She hops in her muck boots and goes just trotting on down the clay road. Every time you take a step, your boot weighs an extra pound, right? And she just stumbles up onto this random house and knocks on the door because her cell phone isn't working and asks, hey, can I use your phone? And this being where we're at, that's, that can be somewhat of a safe thing to do, but she was out of options. And luckily, an older couple answered the phone. She got a hold of Rowdy, I think via B. He came down to pull her out, and he got stuck. We had to call somebody else that's community adjacent, and he came out, and he almost got stuck. It was a whole, it was a home boondoggle, but what Jeanette witnessed during that was the power of community coming together to help her out, no questions asked. And then as far as the build went, uh, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars of material for the average house on the ground, all being slung through midair and put on a foundation. You've just sunk a lot of money into all at once. So there has to be a bit of faith there. And uh, there had to be a lot of faith. And I, we could, I could see it in Jeanette's face. She wasn't quite sure that I had done my homework. But by the end of the day, uh, I'd say we, we did really well, you know, especially for the... Uh, 
We had some very key leaders in that aspect that helped us build that it wouldn't have been successful uh, without them. But we had a lot of willing bodies that just showed up and said, hey, how can I help? And we made it happen. It's a powerful day. It was a very powerful day. So my mindset that drove us to leave Indiana and come to Kansas uh, was, <laughs> I'll give you both sides of the coin. There was, a, there was the apprehensive mindset, right, that we had to take that homestead down, and we had to fold it down, and we had to take a step back because we were on a roll, right? Now, I granted it wasn't as big of a roll as we're on now, but we were making progress. On the positive note, we realized that the community aspect of it that we had just a small taste of in Indiana was what was waiting for us in the future, right? And that was the that was the determining factor. That's what turned us from our very comfortable place in Indiana where we didn't have to leave the property. I could probably could have stayed there for a year, easy. Never had to leave, right? That's what took us and made us turn over to make that risk in order to make our adventure out to Kansas, because without community, we would have never done this. I would never move to Kansas if it wasn't for community. Sorry if y'all love Kansas. You're born and raised here. Some parts of the state are great, but uh, we left uh, a really nice rolling hill area of Indiana. My well was producing over 100 gallons a minute. I mean, I had farmland around me as far as I could see, so it, it took a lot to give that up to come here, and we found a great piece of property, and we found an amazing community that made that happen. It was, it was easy to come to that decision, and I'll tell you what made, the, what made the difference. We came out and previewed it. I spent time at the firewood processing, you know, and I was already excited, and I, went, I was the one that was apprehensive. That was a fun day. And that was, that was a great experience, and I thought to myself, okay, this is the real deal. So now that switch in me is flipped. Now I just have to convince my wife, and I can't convince my wife of anything. It's just not, I don't have that ability. It's not, I wasn't programmed with that part, right? So I had to send her out to convince herself and to have the community reflect upon her how important it was. And she came back, and she was like, I don't know what you're waiting for. I was already sold. <laughs> any other any other questions? Got one in the back. I'm coming got, to you with got the, the microphone mic. coming in for you. How, do, how come you didn't convince your friends that you left in Indiana to come with you, and how would you do that? Yeah, so... That one is difficult depending on how uh, involved your friends are in their homestead, right? So our friends, uh, they both had veterinary practices that they had stood up uh, from the ground up. Uh, one in particular was independent, had his own business, his own clientele. He's so busy that uh, he has to turn clients away. So it's hard for him to leave that area also because they invested in a piece of property where they're at. Right, and they've built their homestead, and they, they're, they're years and years and years and years into this process. So uh, their journey was difficult, as it was, because of how they built and where they built. Uh, I do need to reach out to them and just convey to them, like, hey, this is important. What we've experienced here is no joke. In fact, uh, I was talking with Jeanette this morning that we need to reach out to our friends and just say hi and check in on them and see how they're doing, because maybe they're going through something that's you know, maybe tipping them one way or another and saying, hey, there's a community out here waiting on you uh, might wind up paying dividends. So, go ahead. How do you do this? I, I want to do homesteading so bad. Uh, we bought property. We haven't built anything. I want to build my own house, just like you said. But how do you do that with a full-time job? Because I'm not going to be able to quit anytime soon. Okay, so it's all about context, right? I don't have a full-time job right now because we saved on the front end and my previous occupation allows me to continue to collect income. So with a full-time job, the only way I could think that that would happen is I'm saving energy capital. I'm, I'm saving energy capital by doing labor myself in a roundabout sort of way. You may have to invest your energy capital to get your bill off the ground because Building a house with a full-time job for me, I don't have the bandwidth to do it in any appreciable time at the scale that I'm doing it. However, there are ways that you can overcome that. Maybe you start small. Tag is a master of building in pods, and he also has an extremely busy schedule. So I think that it can be done. My, my example is not a good scenario, but starting small and starting realistic and having a goal 
and knowing what that is far in advance will help you achieve that goal quicker than uh, I get a lot of questions sometimes. Your question is really great, but sometimes I get questions where people basically ask questions into submission. They're too, they're, the obstacles are too big. I can't eat this elephant one or, you know, in one bite. But you break that elephant down, right, and you take small bites, and it's absolutely achievable. I've seen some, some folks that are here that are actually coming up later achieve some pretty astonishing things in, in the face of, of massive challenges. And maybe they'll speak to that a little bit uh, at the end when they get a chance. You know I'm looking at you guys. <laughs> Uh huh. Uh huh. So, good question though. And if you want some more specifics, uh, I have more time set aside at the end that we can talk about that too, and I can give you some insight. You can do it. It's just a management issue. Raw, 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 raw. All right, Mike. I think you have a knife to give away. There's a question. You got another question over there, Bobby. There's another question back there. We have one up front too, real quick. Oh, yeah, one front? up here too. Uh, we ended up showing up to a festival. I think my wife was watching Billy Bond. We led to another channel, led to another channel. We bounced from festival to festival, and, and uh, we actually met Tag at SRF. One more? Am I on? The city, the cities are moving out so fast. How far out in the country are you? Cheyenne is just tripling. Uh, Denver, I drove through Denver for about 35 miles, and I never got in town. Several miles, and I can give you more specific information on that. If anybody wants to know about that specific question, that's kind of in depth, but I'll be more than happy to provide you some insight on things that you can look for to find out if you're far enough away or not, uh, as far as building and zoning and stuff goes. All right. All right, I got to make a tough decision, right? Best question out there. And the hardest question for me is how do you get your friends and your family to follow you? to this journey because for us it was simple enough to make a decision for us to do it but it's extremely difficult to get that buy-in and to convince others to come with you and I think that that is the the most difficult question to answer a lot of that uh those questions that you guys had were good but that's the most difficult one that I have a hard time with so I'm gonna I'll give I'll bring it back to you guys thank you Mike that was good all right, let's go ahead and get started with the next presentation from our buddy Hitch. He's going to come up here and give you a talk about animal care after the zombies have eaten the brains. So give it up for my buddy Hitch. Yeah. Don't forget to tip your waiters and waitresses. Hey everybody, you everyone hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Is anybody in the crowd here a trauma nurse in an ER, paramedic, uh, surgeon, maybe you're a corpsman, anybody with any trauma experience? Well, no one's hurt, so, okay, what are you? Not a surgeon, <laughs> paramedic. Paramed okay, well, you're a paramedic. Do you deal with trauma? Sure. You've, you've seen, like, gashed open wounds, blood coming out? And you, sure. you had to deal with that? Yeah, sure. He sounds real confident, doesn't he? <laughs> Maybe we don't want to get in his ambulance. But you understand, folks, you understand the point. Yep. People in these fields have dealt with serious wound trauma. If we had someone here get a compound fracture, you know, that's the bone sticking out of the meat, or other piercing trauma, now that we know this, what's your name? Andrew, now that we know this about Andrew, would it make sense to have someone like Andrew deal with that, or would we all go to YouTube first? Sh show of hands. Would you show of hands for Andrew. Okay, show of hands for YouTube. Why do you do that in homesteading? Okay, guys, I, I'm going to give you a basic primer today, because we've only got 15 minutes, and this is a very long subject, but basic primer about Livestock management, post shit hits the fan, Tia Twaki type of deal. And I'm going to tell you, I see more and more people that just totally rely on the YouTube uh, university and the YouTube experts out there that are posting great videos, great production value, zero experience in the real world with what they're doing. I mean, if you go back a year later, 
Some of these people aren't even there anymore, or they've sold out or moved. I see it all the time. So what I want to talk to you today about, let me get my notes out there digital on my phone, I'm trying to be 21st century here. Don't YouTube it. <laughs> I'm YouTubing as I go along. <laughs> So, anybody here have livestock already? Good, good, good. Do you think you learned more before you had them, or a year later you'd learned a lot? Right, right. And that goes along parallel to what I've always spoke to people about this for what, Bobby, going on 10 years maybe, 10 years or more I've been doing presentations. Live your preps. This is a prepper festival. I realize some of you are, maybe you're just homesteaders, but the same goes for you. If come November 6th, things start to look a little sketch, and you can't get the food for your livestock at the feed store anymore, what are you going to do if you haven't tried experimenting with it ahead of that? SOL comes to mind. Does anyone know what that means? Shit out of luck. So let's talk a little bit about how you'd manage that. I think first and foremost, and some of us are already stuck with what we got, but those that haven't that are interested in getting into homesteading and prepping as a lifestyle, I would consider location, location, location. And so we've talked a little bit about finding a location near a community or, or there's other people that can support you, and I think that's really important. But I also think what's important is something that I get asked a lot or I hear people chit-chatting about or talking with my realtor friends. I just want four or five acres. I want to move out in the country. I want four or five acres, three acres maybe. I don't want to have a big piece of property. And so what I've started doing with these people is I, you know, draw on a piece of paper what four or five acres looks like, and then what 40 acres look like, and 80 acres looks like, and I say, okay, now, <clears throat> shit hits the fan, how close do you want your nearest neighbors that don't participate to be? You want them to be within four or five acres, or you want them to be 40 acres away? Because the reality is, if you live in a development where there's a whole bunch of five acre or 10 acre parcels, and there's 50 people there, and you're the only prepper, you might get voted off your own island, or worse. And so, you know, I think from observations of some of the people who have been doing this a little while, I think 40 acres is really where the bare minimum there you want to start. And if you look at you talk to some of the realtors, and you look at it realistically, like in these ag areas like, like here, if you can get 40 or 80 acres, don't worry about what you're going to do with the rest of it. Figure out strategically by talking to some of the people here that know where you want to locate your house, or if there's a house already on it, you know, how you make that more defendable and usable so that you can use that entire space. And the price of that 40 or 80 acres might surprise you. Generally, in these more rural areas, I'm not talking about Douglas County per se, but further out, it's going to be the same as it would be for the 5 or 10 acres where there's a little development of houses. And that's because there's a whole bunch of people who want 5 acres, and there's less people want 40 acres. But we're the, we're the 40 and 80 acres people, or more if you can afford it and get it. Again, don't, don't worry about what you're going to do with the rest of it. Figure out how you're going to make that usable. And so if you're going to homestead with livestock, after shit hits the fan, how are you going to feed all these animals? How are you going to water them? And that's why you're going to need more space. You need to think about your ruminants and where you're going to graze them at. You know, if you've got dogs and other carnivores, how are you going to feed them? Where's that going to come from? you're not going to hunt on five acres. And if there's 50 people living around you, they're all thinking they're going to hunt too. So I want you to consider some of those things you're looking at that property. If you don't have that and the surrounding acreage around you, if you get real lucky and you know, you've got the five acres and around you is 500 acres of corn or you know, trees or something like that, well then maybe that works to your benefit as long as that doesn't get developed. Because you know, if that guy's gone and he's not farming anymore, or he died in his house, then you might have that land to deal with and and use and work with. So let's talk about water. Where would you get your water sources if you're already getting your water from the, the county or the city or the water watershed, you know, the water department? Do you have a well? If you have a well, does it rely on electricity? And then if it's an electric well and the electricity fails, I don't care, you know, you got solar, you got wind, you got batteries. Ten years down the road, that's probably toast. I mean, it's just a grim reality, right? Some, you, you could have all the extra parts in the world, and there's going to be this one Achilles heel. Am I right, Hancock? There'll be this one thing that, oh, I need a flux capacitor lever H style, and I don't have one, and there ain't one around. Murphy's Law is real. Right, Murphy's Law is real, and it'll be in full effect, and it will kill you at that time. 
So I want you to think about that. And I'm not, again, I'm not here to give you all the, the de details and definitions. I'm trying to give you talking points and things to think about. And I'll post this little thing here, this little format I have on the Midwest Prepper so you guys can look at it later and consider it. Um, does your property have ponds? Maybe you can build some ponds on Again, if you only got five acres, it gets hard to build a three-acre pond if you're going to have a house there too. If you got 40 acres, maybe you can build more than one pond. You know, if you got 160 acres, you could really build several ponds. So there'll be definitely, you know, unless you're someplace really, really flat, there'll be other places you can build ponds. Maybe there's streams and rivers that you can develop and use. Those also come with their own problems of fencing and such, but again, those are water sources and supplies that might be available a long time. Um, the post that I'll make in the preppers page has a link to K-State Bookstore where there's a free PDF you can download that's really useful about waters and water systems. Super, super cool and it would totally fit this crowd. So talking about feed for the animals. <clears throat> Does anybody here grow or otherwise completely process all the feed for their livestock right now? It's hard to do. Sir? Right. Okay, so he's talking about hay, which is good. Because the, the hay fields, are they someplace where you could convert those to grazing if you don't have diesel anymore? Something to think about, right? Okay, okay. I, I'm not 100% off the, the grid, so to speak, on raising my livestock yet. But it's a goal that I have, and we work at it every year. Um, you know, we've, we've got 240 acres, 270 acres roughly to, to work with there, and it, it requires a lot of cross-fencing and a lot of special planting of grasses and indigenous grasses and indigenous forbs and management and moving the animals around and making sure they can get access to feed and or to, to water. There's, there's a whole plan that goes with that. Hey, man. It takes three years to get a lot of your indigenous grasses started if they're not already there. Because you got to plant them, you got to let them grow, you got to manage it a little bit, but you can't let the animals out there and graze it to the dirt or it'll die. You know, blue stem and Indian grass and stuff like that's great in droughts, but it's got to develop its roots the first few years. It doesn't get those 12 to 15 foot roots, you know, on day one. Oh, uh, let's see, we talked about dogs earlier. What are you going to feed your dogs? Anybody got any plans there? So you will have dogs, right? So you can't get dog food at the store anymore. You're going to feed them your sheep and goats that you need to eat. I mean, you can feed them some of the awful, but I mean, that's okay. That day or that week's gone. You know, there's a lot of talk about raising uh, rabbits. Rabbits is a good thing because rabbits can eat grass, they can eat that hay, they can eat a lot of things that you could grow that you have around you, but you have to develop that program now. You know, touching on the idea about producing your own grain, man, that's that's almost impossible today. I mean, it's something you could explore. I'm being told i got five minutes left. Okay, I need to hurry up here. Give some thought to veterinary work. What are you going to do with your vet, you know, as far as your veterinary meds and stuff like that? You know, I hear a lot of people talk about, who do I use for a vet? I don't. I use my vet for post-mortem. If I have two or more die in a row, I assume that there's probably some sort of an outbreak or a problem that I need to take those animals over to my veterinary and have them figure out why they're dying. Otherwise, I'm my own vet. If it looks like something small, I can stitch up, I stitch it up, I treat it, you know, learn the wound care ahead of time. Otherwise, I use a real sharp knife or a gun and put them down and then they become dog food or my food. It's a grim reality, guys. And the better you get at culling out the weak animals today, the better chance you have of surviving in the future. Same with your livestock. Eat the failures. Feed them to the dogs. Uh, shelter. In a time of, you know, post hit, shit hits the fan, you know, shelter may not be what you think it is today. Again, a lot of people want to, you know, live in this world where we got a barn and we got a corral and we got this and that and whatever. But if you're having to shepherd these animals out in the field to graze during the day, you know, the shelter may not be what it is today for you. And you should make some plans for that. Um, it may not be advantageous to you in a post-shit-hit-the-fan scenario to shelter them next to your house because people can hear them a mile or two away. You might want to make sure you got something back in the woods where you can hide them in if you have to, or hide some of them in. Again, these are considerations. And if you're out there grazing in these open fields, having a corral at night to bring them all back in, go out during the day, let them graze, you know, shepherd them. 
practice with that though. Sheep and cows, goats, all of them, they, you can shepherd them out in the field and they can be trained to do most of their eating in an hour or two and do their day's drinking during that time too. And you run them back in the shade and they'll be fine till the next day. They still do it that way in France and Spain and Italy today. And there's some really great videos on that, by the way. Okay, defense. So if you're out there shepherding, you might want someone out there that's shepherding you quietly and silently. Because if it's post shit hit the fan and you got a flock of goats or sheep out there making noise and there's hungry people coming down the road like, hey, I hear livestock over there. Yes, let's go over there with our guns and we shall hunt some of them. Oh, look, there's one guy out there. Well, that's no problem. He's not going to eat much anymore. You might want a couple guys up on the hillside with rifles and, you know, that could start telling those people from 400 yards away, you don't want to come here. I know this is a grim reality, folks. LGDs. Does anybody here have LGDs, livestock guardian dogs? If you're going to have livestock post shit hits the fan, that's something that I highly recommend. Even if, you know, you just have a few acres, you could have one as a barnyard dog. I mean, they... They work kind of either way, Not generally don't work for both. There's some great websites and groups and people that, that can tell you a lot about LGDs. Um, we have one called Farmers Only LGDs on Facebook. And it's a good idea to have a barnyard dog or a farm dog. Get to be a mixed mongrel, but something that's going to bark when people show up. Maybe bite the hell out of somebody if they come take something. You know? These are all things to consider, but I want folks to really stop and think about Get away from the romance and the anthropomorphization of your livestock and think about how you're going to really keep them alive. You know, how you're, how you're really going to do this because it will be life and death at that point. Does anybody have any questions? The Grim Reaper spoke too much. Stop scaring my audience. <laughs> now go ahead, scare them. It's a prepper show, guys. Come on. Someone's got to have a question. Mr. Uh, paramedic, do you have a sharp knife with you, besides the one on your chest? Yeah, this one's sharper. I don't think that's long enough. <laughs> oh. You want that one? Oh, yeah. Since I picked oh, there it up. Yeah. Thanks, folks. All right, guys, let's move it along to the next presentation. This is going to be Jeff and Louise from His Grace Homestead. And they're going to be talking to you next. Let's get them up here. Give them a warm round of applause. Tell them thank you for melting on this lovely fall day. Probably not. Not fall yet. No. All right, here you guys go. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I thought it was ironic that we're going after Hitch because we're talking about the poor man's cow. Does anybody know what that is? The poor man's cow. No. <laughs> it actually is a cow. Um, but they eat like a goat. They eat like a goat. They survive on land like a goat. They originate in Ireland, and they're called the I Irish Dexter. They're smaller in stature. They um, are great. They thrive in um, poor land, poor pasture. Um, we came from Tennessee. We had Nigerian dwarf goats on 10 acres, and we learned pretty quick that they could not keep manage the land. So rather than building another barn, we decided let's look at a larger animal for our homestead. And um, I had a friend that had some Dexters, and we went over. She said, I'll make you a great deal. That's the first, your first clue. Don't let them make you a great deal. Walk away. Be careful. Um, be careful. But um, we borrowed a trailer. We went, loaded up five Dexters for $1,000. We brought them home. They all fit. They all in fit. A 12-foot livestock trailer. <laughs> so we brought them home. Um, these, these cows had horns. That was something I wasn't really you know, interested in, but it was a good deal. Um, our focus, though, for our homestead is we wanted to be able to milk, we wanted to be able to make butter, we wanted, and we wanted beef. So I would tell anybody, if you just want strictly beef, 
you go out there and get you a cheap Dexter. Um, but if you want to milk, you better make sure that you get one that won't kick the fire out of you, that won't. What we learned, you can, can you hear me? Oh, hold up there. Okay, sorry. You gotta use the mic. <laughs> what we learned was all Dexters are not created equal. And it's because we didn't know what their bloodline was. We don't even know that they were pure Dexters. We, we had no idea. We had no way of knowing that. So um, we sold those and decided to go with a registered Irish Dexter. We checked out two farms. What they did was they showed their Dexters when they were young, so they'd already went through all the handling and training, halter training process. So when we got them, it was easy peasy. Um, my first Dexter, I bought her from our regional director in Tennessee. We brought her home. She had only been shown. That was it. That's the only thing they did with her. Within, She was pregnant after she had her calf. Within six months, I took her to the milk stanchion. I milked her. I made butter. She was a nurse cow. I called uh, Mark Cheney and said, gosh, I said, you sold me a nurse cow, a milk cow. And he said, well, it's all genetics. You get what you get or get what you pay for. But um, what, I, what we found for us, for our homestead, was because they're small than a standard cow, they don't compact your soil. When you have a lot of cows and they're large, they compact your soil. Basically, that just inhibits air getting to it, nutrients getting to it, water. So then you, get, you see fields that have like large barren areas, and it's from compacted soil. Um, they're a heritage breed, like Matt was talking about, like generational. They have such, they came to the United States in the early 1900s, and they have great genetics that are passed down generation after generation. They, um, they're easy calvers. We have never had to help with ours at all. Like, most of the time we wake up the next morning and boom. You know, we were on a live with Tag one night. A Zoom. A Zoom. And I walked out to check her. And sure enough, Tag now owns that calf. <laughs> but, um, so they're a dual purpose. They're good dairy cattle and they're good beef cattle. Uh, one of the things I learned in doing this presentation, I just kind of looked in a little bit more. Um, Gordon Ramsay, people know who he is. He only, he only serves two different types of beef. One is Dexter, the other is Wagyu. And in 2019, the Dexter meat won the 2019 uh, American Royal Steak Competition. I was like, oh, wow, that's kind of impressive. Um, like I said, they do thrive on um, poor soils, poor pastures. They eat weeds and unwanted vegetation. We had a friend that was doing some um, work on our property, and he has cattle. He has standard-sized cattle, and he was amazed that they were eating the ragweed. And I said, yeah. He wanted to borrow one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The other thing that um, I, d I knew going into it, because I told you we wanted to milk and we wanted to be able to make butter, um, and you got to have a cow that will allow you to do that or you're just out of luck. But um, I knew that A2 milk and A1 milk, I knew there was some differences. I knew that A2 was more of a healthier style of milk versus the A1 but I didn't really know a whole lot about. Um, A1 milk is pretty much what you would get like from your grocery store. And I know you hear a lot about people that are lactose intolerant. So I will tell you, it doesn't matter A1 or A2. If you're lactose intolerant, it's going to affect you. But A1 milk actually will destroy the gut. It causes gut inflammation. 
um, it has, it's a peptide that breaks down to the amino acid, but it's a peptide opioid. So it's just not even healthy. For some people, some people can tolerate it. Some people, it just totally destroys. It causes uh, inflammation. It can trigger digestive issues. And I know a lot of people that talk about they can't drink just store-bought milk. One of the things I did learn about was over in um, New Zealand, Australia, and China, it's a norm for them to get A2 milk. It's a rarity to get it here in the United States. We have to find a local farmer that has cattle that have A2 milk. And the only way you're going to find that is if you have them genetically tested. I wouldn't take anybody's word for it. I wouldn't want to see what the genetic test showed because a lot of people will tell you, oh, yeah, they're A2. Not, not always the truth, unfortunately. But um, so A2 milk, this is what I found out. A2 milk is beneficial to overall health. It is a very good source for vitamins um, A, D, B12, potassium, iron. It has high omega-3 fatty acids in it. It can actually lower our blood pressure. It can regulate our blood sugar. It strengthens the immune system. What happens is the difference between the A1 and the A2, the A2 has an amino acid, it's a proline, and it has so many good benefits. And you know, as we are approaching unchartered territories with our country, well, you want to keep yourself as healthy as possible. So I would tell people, if there's any way you could locate a local farm or anything that has dairy cattle with A2 milk, I would look at trying to reach out to them and say, do you guys milk, do you sell milk, and can I get some? The other thing with the ProLine is it um, has primary components of collagen. Collagen, you guys were talking about, okay. You guys were talking about um, tissue repair, wounds, and stuff like that. I mean, that's another important. We want to be able to keep our skin, our tissue is in optimal working order. So being high levels of collagen will help with that. Um, again, Dexter's was our go-to cow. Um, we love them. We had a friend, Scott, come last weekend. I think he was kind of impressed with him, uh, my big 1,200-pound Dexter bull. Um, he's just a big baby. He loves to be loved on. Um, this summer I had to take him to the vet. You know, I do take him to the vet. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> but he had a little irritant in his eye, and uh, the vet was like, oh, my gosh. She's, I said, well, he's never been in a cattle shoot. He's been in a head gate, but not a cattle shoot. And she said, I said, what do you want me to do? Because I didn't know if I was allowed to walk through. And she said, yeah, walk through. He followed me right through the cattle shoot. And, you know, she took care of him, and I loaded him back up, walked him in the trailer, and we went home. So to me, I would recommend strongly people for your homestead. Look at a cow that you can, no matter what the breed is, but look at one that you can truly handle and you can do what you want to with it. That's going to bring you health. And anybody have questions? Oh. <laughs> a couple. Everybody? Yeah, well, I got a few. <laughs> uh, so first is, uh, what is what is the size difference in weight between you know you talked about a, a normal cow versus uh, yep. Irish Dexters? What the, is the, size the normal size of a standard cow can go up to sixty inches. And a normal size, and this is at the hip measurements, is going to be between 34 and 50 inches. What does that translate, translate to in weight? Um, on the hoof? On the hoof, uh, like I have one right now, he's 1,200 pounds. Okay. But your average is going to be around 1,000 pounds. Okay. But then your, de your standard cows, gosh, I don't know. I think you eat half of what a normal cow is. Okay. True. And we, we have had... Standard cows. We, you know, we have in the past raised standard cows. Um, we had one that 
we couldn't wait to get rid of. Jeff even delivered him to Virginia, or her to Virginia, because she ate so much. Wow. We couldn't afford to keep her. So I feel like we have had the comparison. Okay. So what, what is, when you process them out, what's the yield in We, um, do you remember what, Jimmy? Well, we, we haven't processed ours. We've taken them off. Okay. Right. And I had to decide at that point. When I, when I took the cow in, I said, I'm trying to decide, is it better for me to sell these cows and then buy from somebody else a regular cow mm -hmm. or for me to raise them and bring them and process them? Okay. He said, I'll let you know. I came back, and he told me, he said, that's the best marbling I have ever saw. Wow. He and said, I would raise them for meat. That okay. was his first Dexter. And that was his first Dexter he had processed. Last question. Um, you mentioned the, the unregistered ones that you got a great deal on versus the registered ones. What can you can you tell us what like the price difference was per head? Yes. Um, well, you what can you get expect? you can typically find uh, an unregistered Dexter for about five hundred bucks. Okay. Um, to I, a thousand. To a thousand. You know. The most I have paid for, like my bull was twenty five hundred. Okay. Um, my girls, pregnant, they were twenty two hundred. Okay. Registered. Registered. Okay. All yeah. Registered. Okay. That's not bad. I didn't think so, and like I say, the the two breeders that I chose to buy from were like they're well known in the Dexter world. Okay. Yeah, my my bull I found out this year, his daddy is now living over in Missouri. Sorry. How many bulls per acre or cows one, per acre? One to two acres per Dexter. Really? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, first I want to thank you for explaining the difference between uh, the different types of milk because I've heard that used in conversation and didn't really know what that meant. Me either. Um, not be in tune to this but my question is when you switch to um, what was the good milk again a2 a2 when you switch to a2 did you notice a difference in your body on how your body processed it or how your body reacted to it no I honestly don't because I really never had any digestive issues you didn't have any so it would really be someone that had digestive issues and then transfer them to the A2 milk and see if and they're. We do have somebody in the community that has those issues that want and they to want try to try. It, so we'll know more once we get our barn built and we're able to milk. Right, yeah. right. Yep. Sorry, we are still in the building Soon, phase. Soon. Yep. Yep. We're in the concrete phase right now. <laughs> Tag's favorite. Anybody else have any questions? All right, Tag has one. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, you spoke too soon. Over here first, though. There we go. <laughs> no. no, no, no. Go ahead, Tag. Go ahead. <laughs> so you said that the, the most expensive one you ever bought was $2,500, and yet I want everyone to know for the record, she that talked my wife into spending more than that on one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, but you hey, got a good hey. deal on one, too. I did. <laughs> did they make I you a good deal? I did save you $500, though. I talked her down to $3,000. She won $3,500. Yeah. yeah, just because it says it's a sale, it's not a sale for all you ladies out there. <laughs> <laughs> just so we're clear. Well, and when we when B and I went looking at her, she actually came from Tennessee, the same farm, Freedom Farms. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> My, my but, question. But now, Tag, seriously, you've had them for a bit. How do you feel about them? Um, the biggest difference, we have an Angus, and then we have a bunch of Dexters. And um, the Dexters are just so much more mild. Um, they're also a little bit smaller. So, you know, one of my wife's, one of her concerns was being able to manhandle them. Right. Because they're such big animals. Um, and so I think that the size is a great benefit. And I also think that just the temperament for us fits our homestead really well. But also, with your mild Dexters, they have a different bloodline than the ones like that we had. The first one. Well, some of them do. <laughs> some of them came from you. I, yes. yes. Okay. I'm talking the originals that we sold. Yeah. 
Lou, my question that I have for you is, you know, you guys came out and came here from Tennessee with a functioning homestead, and I just thought Mike had alluded to this earlier. Maybe talk a little bit about what drew you guys out here and why you were willing to give up at, at your age, no offense, but why you were willing to give up. Um, Jeff is really old, if you guys haven't noticed. Why were you willing to do this at 29? <laughs> why were you willing? We lived, um, I will be... We lived in probably the most beautiful part of Tennessee. We lived up in Carter County, Roan Mountain, Tennessee, um, way up high on a knob. We off-grid, water, electric. Um, we had a barn. All my all my cows are barn kept, stall kept, um, because we have red wolves, we have bear, we you name it, we had it. Um, yes, eastern cougars. Um, we have two. We have a Kangle and a Anatolian as our livestock guardian dogs. But um, we had we were debt free. I mean we had it made. And one thing. Community. community. We we missed and I, I will say the first year I was here we went through a lot of traumatic um, fifteen trips, a thousand miles to move our whole farm here. Um, because of tag <laughs> and our community we that's what drove that's what attracted us here but that's not what that's not what is keeping us we love it we love the people um anytime we have hit obstacles pick up the phone and they're right there to help and we you couldn't find that in tennessee i mean we had some great friends we had but people, we had good people but we could not find community like that and you know i know b has told me that one day community is all we're going to have. Yep. Are you graining these or just grass? Right now they are just strictly grass. Um, in the winter time, I will do both, but only a morning grain. And then, but I don't have to. They can. I know a lot of people that have Dexter's strictly grass and hay. A2, do you test the herd or do you test the milk? I test the cow. When I get them, uh, or when they're born, I pull their tail hairs, I send it off to the genetic lab, and then they have it. Now, if you know, if you have the genetic information on the mother and the father, you don't typically have to, you know, test the offspring. Yes, but I do. Every one of my cows are tested. And it's, I mean, genetic testing, when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, gosh, telling him he's going to be against this. But you can have a cow tested for, like, 25 bucks and know everything you need to know about. Anybody else? All right, I think it's time for you to give away your knife. All right. Who can tell me... What they call a Dexter cow? Four minutes cow. Oh, who said that? Oh, Woo! Yeah. There you go. Bingo. Four minutes. Well, thank Four you, sir. Cow. All right. Thank you so much to you thank two. You. Thanks for coming out. If I'm not mistaken, this is your first time speaking at Midwest. The community yes. continues to grow. Yes. All right. Now for our final set of speakers. It's somebody that bears no need of introduction, so I'm just going to bring them up. It's going to be Tag and B from Life Done Free. <laughs> Dramatic entrance as always. <laughs> We're coming. Sorry. My wife's behind me. Don't let him blame it on you, B. I always I blame everything fault. on B. Hey, I thought I'd give my knife away first, okay, because I just got to buck the system. Um, I, there's been a young man sitting over there that has been watching all of these presentations, patient, and just watching it, and if his parents will allow him to have it, I'd like to give him the knife. Yes. <laughs> Matthew? Get up here, Matthew. Yeah. He's, he's the woodchopper. 
Yeah. Well, the wood chopper has another knife. Yes. Thank you. Of course. You're very welcome. That's number two of ten. It's very special. Very special. <laughs> hey, uh, first, for those of you guys who don't know who we are, we're Tag and B. We have the YouTube channel Life Done Free, but most importantly, just know that uh, we're 100% off-grid homesteaders, and so when we talk about these things, we live it every single day. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people homestead that are here? How many people that aren't that want to? Yeah, um, so homesteading, you guys, is really hard, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it at all. Um, when you add off-grid living to homesteading, it becomes even more hard. <laughs> and then when you add homeschooling to that, that becomes even more hard. And, you know, I think the question you have to ask yourself is, is it any harder than being a slave to the system? You know, this is a point where you get to choose your master. And do I want my master to be my career? Do I want my master to be the system? Do I want to ask permission for my electricity? Do I want to ask permission for my food? Do I want to be subject to whatever they're putting in my food? Do I want to be subject to the medical system? Do I want to do those things or do I want to be my own master? The problem is, is that being your own master, there really isn't anyone to rely on but yourself. And you have to kind of be, um, you know, kind of everything. And so we thought today me and B would have a little bit of fun. And we'd pick on each other as we often do um, in our lives. Um, for those who don't know, we do a live every Friday night. And um, so I'm going to point out some of the blunders that B's made along the way and um, talk about the lessons that maybe we've learned through that. And she's going to spend some time <laughs> talking about my craziness. So you get three minutes and she gets 12. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's about how it's going to go too, Adcock. Um, so we're going to kind of go through that a little bit, and then we'll kind of wrap it up with how that all matters and what goes on between your ears and how it's so powerful. And probably if you were going to learn anything about homesteading, I will tell you that what goes on between your ears matters more than anything. How you look at any situation matters more than anything. Um, but anyway, so let's talk a little bit. I'm going to be back up just a little quick. Just a little bit of reference for you guys. So, so you guys know five years ago I knew nothing about homesteading. I didn't know anything about um, living off-grid. I didn't know anything about how to move water. I didn't know anything about a lot of you. About what? <laughs> yeah, for you, what did you not know anything about? Because you were a gardener before. Somewhat. Well, not how you garden now, but... Right, no. Um, no, I had a few buckets of tomato plants here and there and um, tried some sauerkraut and things like that. But if it didn't pan out, then I just threw it away and kind of didn't talk about it. Didn't really rely on feeding my family that. So I, ha I always had that backup mm -hmm. pantry. Yeah. But. yeah. As we talk about the blunders we made, I want to share a real quick story with you guys. They're not here today. They'll be here, I think tomorrow or Saturday, but American Roots Farm, Jess came to me one day and she said to me, Tag, this is so hard and everything you do works. You don't seem to have any struggles. I'm like, you watch too much YouTube. Because <laughs> the fact of the matter, you guys, and, and you've heard many people talk about how I'm an encourager and I do those things and I do, 100% true, but the truth is I throw my hammer too. The truth is I have my problems too. I also have my moments I have to walk away. Um, to do it. So I'm going to start picking on B real quick and um, ask her to tell you guys a couple stories. So B had quite a lesson uh, learning um, that 21 days in an incubator don't necessarily mean 21 days. You want to talk about the squirming chicks? No, the, it, that, that wasn't the point. It, it, 21 days is 21 days if you start from day one. But if you gather them from the yard, you have no idea when day one was. So if you guesstimate it and you play that out and there's still some that are not yet right. here <laughs> and you think that that's the end of the story and you go to dispose of said non-productive items they're not necessarily all duds and so and so when you throw them on the concrete for the dogs to eat and the little chicks are so moving around like this as they're eating alive that taught you what lesson the once was bad, twice is worse, third time is... You kind of get used to it, I guess. What's that? Oh. I don't do that because I don't want them to learn to think that that's a normal thing. So, But the dogs, on the other hand, since they're not in the chicken coop on a regular basis, then they get one It's not that bad. I think, well, unless you have glass ones because, like, 
you put those aside after you're cleaning the coop and you set those out and then the dog gets those and they take them into the yard and think that they're real eggs and then they break them. Yeah, I've learned a lot of lessons. You want to pick on me about something? You got a list. Well, no, I mean, I, right. I think the worst thing for you is that um, water, you know, we, we, we deal with water. Water has been our biggest struggle, I think, on the homestead, either water coming in, you know, rainwater, uh, putting the building in the wrong place, drainage, or not crimping water lines yeah. in the walls and then finishing the walls and then adding the water to the house and then the house starts leaking. <laughs> well, you would think that you would learn that the first time or the second time. The third time, you know, it's, it's a... <laughs> Well, no, the, the, the example well, she's giving... She, he didn't even crimp it, I didn't though. Crimp I mean, it. They, were, they were full on, like, uh, yeah, it, ready to be used. Well, for, for, in my defense, even though there isn't much one, but in my defense, so we built our house in pods because pods. I didn't want to bankroll anything. I wanted to do it out of my pocket. And so we, the first pod we built was a uh, 20 by 30. It had uh, two bedrooms and a kitchen and a bathroom in it because I knew that if the shit hit the fan tomorrow, we could live there. And so that was all fine. And then when I added pod two, which was our living room, the water line that ran in the wall, I didn't crimp it. And so um, I get it all ready to go. Everything's exciting. I flip the switch and water starts pouring out my wall, <laughs> which means I have to tear the wall down. Well, tear it, all actually, the it took down. us a while to figure that out. I mean, the, wall, the water had to come through the wall. My, my memory is you were on my ass instantly. For, no. It, <laughs> it took significant... I mean, the water had to start pouring out the bottom before we were like, hey, that's weird. Is that supposed to be like that? So like five minutes? No. <laughs> it was a while. Yeah, I did do it three times before yeah. it was all over. But one of them wasn't a crimp. One of them was just a split. Here's another lesson I learned, just so you guys know. When you're building a house and you're building in pods, it'd be better to build from the north to the south than from the south to the north. Oh, Okay, this is a massive lesson because you get the north winds. And so when you're building in a pod and you know you got another pod coming next to it and you've got a water line in that north wall, you typically wouldn't put a water line in a north wall, but you got another pod coming. So you've dumped your water lines in that north wall and now you get into a winter and it's a freezing winter. Now you're cracking pipes and you're breaking stuff all because you don't have that next pod put up. And that happened to me, which is the last one we dealt with in our master bath bedroom, which we're trying to get finished now. But You don't realize until You don't realize until it thaws and then there's water you know kind of going everywhere um but speaking of uh, screw-ups did you know that my wife can tell you you can actually waterboard a chicken oh wow yeah that was no, an accident. you can no so i was just trying to give her fluids <laughs> just like you know help her with the fluids and she didn't swallow it so she died yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, there's there's things that you, you have to go through to learn it. Like, you're, you know, it sounds super easy to, like, oh, just give them fluids. Use a little syringe, not the, the not the you know, needle, just the, the thing. Okay? Right. So she'll just drink it. She'll just drink it up. Sometimes. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, they don't, after, you know, you, after they've ingested the water, they don't last very long anyway. You don't have to call them. They just, they go all by themselves. So, but again, that's another lesson because, you know, you spend, you spend so much time getting these animals and trying to keep them alive, um, you know, what's best for them, and then you don't know what you're doing, so you just try it, and then you're like, no, but that is the way to go, you need fluids, and so you're like, okay, well, I'll just try it again on the next one, and then you're like, okay, well... By the time, like, I've come to the point where I'm like, okay, you're going to make it or you're just not. And I can't really intervene because I can't spend that time to do so when I have so much other things to be doing. And I'm just going to, like, do the same thing that I've done the last 16 times that didn't freaking work. So. It is a management issue. And actually, all of homesteading is a management issue. Uh, I'm going to, I want to quote Matt up here real quick because I think this is really important here. You know, when I first met Matt. Matt would talk about, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but he would talk about how putting an animal down because it got a sliver. And, you know, I used to think a lot about how brutal that was. And, like, that was 
brutality and that we weren't going to raise our animals like that. It was weak. It, it, yeah, um, and yeah, because Matt's point was it was weak. But you know what I've learned over the over the years of doing that is he was actually right. And really, letting that animal die is probably the most compassionate thing you can do, because you can't every 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 moment you spend trying to nurse that that chicken back to help is a minute you're not spending on the rest of them. It's a minute you're not spending on the baby turkeys. It's a minute you're not spending on, on whatever the 900,000 other things. Um, unfortunately, the chicken's life does not have that much value. And I know that sounds harsh, but it's just the facts. When you're doing it all for yourself, that is a just... My wings all better now. <laughs> cheaper, too, because a lot of those... That's right. Right. That's right. This was a point that, you know, I learned a lot from Matt. And again, at the beginning, I thought he was a lunatic, but... I've learned that he was probably right on this point, you know, Lots, over time. Livestock's a brutal business. It's, it's brutal. It's, it's a, a brutal business. It's a brutal business. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a business. Yeah, you get only yeah. pick on me about Unless, it. and too, like, you have, when you're trying to rely on that food, that could be devastating. So learning that now, instead of waiting Mindset. for, you know, oh, I, you know, oh, my grandpa used to raise cattle. I could figure it out. Yeah, yeah good luck with that. Yeah. No. It's better um, to experiment and fail now when there's a structure for recovery right. than, to, than to get That's in the right. middle of it when it's life and death. That's right. right. So squirt, squirt some more water down them chickens. <laughs> well, I mean, you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so. waterboarding Betty. Yeah. No, no. Um, something else, too, like we talk about all the things that come along and we're going to try this and we're going to try that, animals and chickens and sheep and... Um, the waste of, you know, if we're not going to do it right, then let's not do it at all. And um, we buy all kinds of extra stuff and parts and things and that and store it here and there and may need it. And um, I get a lot of that, but I think you probably take the take the cake with the solar parts. Yeah. So, so we buy so what she's we buy referring extra to solar is... parts on a. Yeah, I even knew, though our solar system is up and running. Yeah, I knew nothing about solar, and luckily um, I had help. Hancock, for example, came out to help me um, to put it in. But I bet I bought three or four thousand dollars worth of parts I didn't need that are still sitting on a shelf it's to this day. Put them in a Faraday cage. Dude. <laughs> I'll, I'll need them someday. Be handy. One day. Bus bars. Yeah, I'll need them someday. All right, babe, we we got a uh, hustle real quick. Um, right. Talk about the hundred fruit trees that you really wanted that I bought that died. I planted them, and it was really <laughs> hot out, and they died. That just happens. Yeah. Well, it does happen, and it's a we 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 learn to we just I don't know we waste a lot of money. <laughs> we do. Yeah, if you ever want to be broke, buy a homestead. Yeah. Yep. That, that's great advice. I promise you. Um, right, and things that you don't know and you break. He, I'm being told we're down to four minutes. By the way. So let's hustle, huh? Go. You want to quit picking on each other? Yeah. Although I had more examples to give. We don't need to do all that. Um, you guys, I think most people most people get into this life, um, and us included, with this you know this idea of grandeur that this you know I'm going to go plant my vegetables and they're going to grow great, and I'm going to raise my animals and they're going to go great, and I'm going to live off grid. It's going to be great, free energy, free water, guys. There ain't anything free about it. It's prepaid. Okay, there's nothing free about it. I promise you that this you know that this is true. Nothing goes go, go, goes according to plan. We get a chance to look at every single situation, just like be waterboarding her chicken or smashing them. You know, I could have harassed her for this. I could have said, look, I worked hard for that. I worked hard to bring that money in. I I worked hard. You need to do better. But at the end of the day, what good would that have done? And if you celebrate your victories together, if you get together, you become a team, right? Me and my wife are a huge team. And, you know, at the end of the day, she's going to screw some stuff up and we're going to laugh about it. And I'm going to make fun of her about it. We're going to go on to the next gig. I promise you this is true. And she's going to do the exact same thing. I get reminded of about the water and the wall constantly. And it's okay. You know, again, this was, this was part of our um, learning experience. To Bullet's point, Bullet talked about how it's management. It's so crazy how it works. But the fact is, living off grid and homesteading is just a management issue. We go from, okay, we get up, it's Monday, we're going to look at the week, what does the sun hold, right? What's our weather going to look like? We're, we're creating our structure around... Okay, what's the weather like around my work schedule? Because I still work outside of the home. Um, and it's just about managing it in these individual incremental pieces. And if you do that, you'll be just fine. There's no difference between living off grid and living on grid other than it's a management issue. You know, there's days. Talk, talk real, real briefly because you don't have very much time. Talk real briefly about red, yellow, and green days. Um, on our solar system, we have a little smart panel where we can decide how much 
energy is coming in at any given minute. So um, we look ahead at the schedule or at the weather and on full days that we have sun, I can do basically anything I want. But if there's a partly cloudy or a mostly cloudy, then those would be more of a yellow day where we're not ironing or doing laundry, but we could, you know, watch TV or run electricity lights. You know, freezers are always on, refrigerators always on, but we kind of minimize the other things that we do. But otherwise, um, sun, sunny days mean every, we live just as everybody else, you know. Uh, air yeah. conditioners. Yeah. Yeah, we live in a 5,000 square foot home, so you don't. So it's not like a little cabin in the middle of the woods somewhere. Babe, real quick, before we go, will you, I want you to talk one more thing about how it's okay if the dishes aren't done. Right. We I think were, this matters um, a lot. Where's, 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 where's Jules? Not. You know, when, I, when we lived in town and, and we had ample electricity to do whatever you want every single day, you know, you plug in the vacuum, and that thing really uses a lot of electricity right then and there. And when you're doing a whole house and you're vacuuming for you know, an hour, then that is a lot of electricity. So, um, we, uh, I have learned to, well, basically lower my standards to, you know, not the, if there's food, if there's dishes, dirty dishes in the sink, it, we usually eat dinner at night. So that comes with dark and then you don't, I don't, I can't run the, the pump, the hot water heater, the, uh, all of the pump for the well, the pump for the tank, the pump for the uh, pressure tank, you know, all of these things run when I'm just running water. So doing that for, you know, and a lot of people just sit there and turn the water on and run it the whole time they're doing dishes. So that's a lot of electricity. Um, leaving the dishes in the sink for the night means not, not only let's not use that electricity for dishes, Let's maybe go spend some time together and watch a movie or something that um, we can do together that is not. Um, it's more important, Talk really, in the grand scheme of things. It's more yeah. important. B said to me that saying no to the dishes was saying yes to me. And saying no to the dishes was saying yes to her family. And so it creates, you know, you've got to create that balance, too. That's super, right. super, super yeah. um, important. Super important. Um, yeah. Hey, guys, we're going to get yeah, out of here because I'm getting the sign. But listen, attitude, commitment are super important. You are what you say you are. I promise you this is true. You've heard people from me tell you that, that it's okay, you can do it, it's easy. But the truth is, guys, I mean it. That's not a facade. I absolutely mean it's easy. You just got to go out. You got to get the right mindset. And if things don't go your way, you know what? Next, go on with it. Enjoy the journey. I mean, at least you get to experience it when millions of other people would die to be in the place that you're at. And you got to put that all into perspective. If the shit hit the fan today, what will we wish we had done? And if you can answer that question, I think you'll be you'll be a long ways off. So, is that okay, Patrick? Fantastic. Do we have time to take a question or two, Tag? We have time. I'm here all day. All right. That's your schedule. Does anybody have questions? We have one over here. You're off grid. How big of a bank do you have to float off of? Yeah, well, that's actually an interesting story. I actually have two of them now. Um, so the one that runs my house, from a battery perspective, is a 38-kilowatt-hour system, from, from a battery perspective. From an inverter perspective, it's 21,000 watts. So I have three 7,000-watt inverters. And it runs, in my house, we can pretty much run everything anybody else can 99% of the time. The problem is, is when we get into days, like this, this last winter, we had a nine-day stretch with no sun. So I got about 66 hours worth of power. So what happens is we know we're going into those. We shut everything down. We're just using the bare minimum. Uh, we're in the middle of building a community building out on our land right now, and we bought a 54-kilowatt-hour system for it. So it's, it'll actually be bigger than my house, but I'm going to trench the two together so I end up with about 96 kilowatt-hours, which will take me from you know, uh, 66 hours to 150 or 160 hours of power. I mean taking from yeah, 66 to 160 hours of power once they get those two stuck together, which we're new level, new devil, baby, right? I mean, that's like leveling up in a, in a big way, but I hope that answers your question. Yes, yeah, yeah. This might be a little too personal, but it's something I've always wondered because we hear about homesteaders and, and their families, but you're the only ones that I know of that are truly off-grid. And we hear about how you handle things as a couple. I'm curious how things are from your daughter's perspective, especially when you have um, your yellow days and your red days, 
how does she handle those days? Great question. Okay, so, you know, it's funny. When I was growing up, we were poor, and I didn't know it. And so I think through Ayla's eyes, she sees everything as a big, grand adventure. You know, the good news is if we can keep, you know, an iPad charging, which we can do 100% of the time, right? If, we, if that's all we did, we would last years, right? I mean, so, <laughs> you know, I think she'd be all right there. Um, but there's been times where all the lights are off. We're not using them. We're using the lanterns. And we try really hard in... Um, our relationship with our daughter to make that an adventure and kind of make that fun, fun. you know, for her. Yeah, what do you think? You yeah. Fun, She's like been doing it her all, all her life. She really doesn't know any really don't know any difference. Uh, yeah. her, some of her earliest memories are the Midwest Preparedness Project. She came to her first Midwest Preparedness Project at six weeks of age <laughs> and, has, and has not missed one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nine. <laughs> so she really don't know life without all you hooligans. <laughs> Poor girl. I know, right? You kidding me? She's, she's going to grow up to rule all of us. I know. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Payback. Uh -oh. Here, you go. Here it comes. So... Tag, you talked about y'all's trials and what, if you went back and got a complete do-over, what would you do differently, if anything? Yeah, well, yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, there's, um, you know, I froze three water pumps before I figured out how to drain them properly. And there's, so there's a lot of those little things, but here's the thing, without that experience, without going through that, I wouldn't know how to drain it properly. You know, the other thing is, too, and, and I, if I was going to give uh, couples any advice at all out there, this is something I would have adopted sooner. I wish I'd have done it sooner. We do it now. <clears throat> I can't be in charge of everything. There's simply not enough bandwidth in my life to do it. My wife cannot be in charge of everything. And so we have managed to, to break apart all of the tasks on the homestead. There are jobs that B's in charge of, and to which at those cases I help her. I'm the laborer, but I just do what I'm told. There are times where I'm in charge, and on those days, she's the laborer. She just does what I'm, she, she's told. This has allowed us um, many things. One, um, we get along great through the process, but I think there's another side to it, too, which is it allows her to express her artistic side. It allows her to express her wants in her place. I don't get involved in it, and it allows me to, too, because I think what happens to a lot of people is you get these two different views of this is what homesteading is and this is what homesteading is, but the fact of the matter is, I couldn't do any of it without my wife. There's no way. And so being able to, um, I don't say allow, that's such a horrible word, but putting be in a position to thrive in what she's great at, and then her not henpecking me to go do what I'm great at, I think is a magic um, you know, recipe for success. Anybody else? All right. Hey, Bobby, I guess I have another knife to give away, and I wanted to give it to the young lady that was sitting up there, too, if she was around. I do. I yeah, that one right, right there. there. <laughs> give me a round of applause. <laughs> Positive reinforcement to the new generation. Hey, one last thing before we go. I just wanted to tell all you guys that came up here and spoke today, I can't tell you how proud I am to watch this community grow and watch the leaders grow. It is just so, man, it's just badass. All right, Bobby, you ready? Hey, Jack. I am. Jack, yeah. real quick. Uh, hey, Katie. Uh, tell them what you told me earlier today. You're not helping out doing any chores because why? You're not helping out doing any chores like Matthew is because why? Because I'm from Chris Katie on? I thought you said you were on vacation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you go, girl. My wife's on a perpetual vacation. Oh. And she got a free cow. <laughs> if you watch the show, you know. You know. Thank you, Tag. Thanks. All right, folks, I just got a text that rain is coming, and it will probably be here around 8 o'clock. It's not supposed to be super heavy, but you might want to put your rain flies on your tents if you have not done so. We got county commissioners. Yeah, you guys go kick some ass. Yeah, we will. All right, thanks for coming out to the first Thursday event that we've had, uh, and we're going to grow this more and more. I'm here all day. I'm here all week. Come buy tickets from me. Uh, one quick other note, at Paratus Radio, there is a display with fire starting stuff, different matches and fire starters. 
that is Midwest's also. And so when you purchase those fire starting things, maybe for the kids for their fire starting challenge or to bulk up your kits, that money goes directly back to Midwest to help pay for the campground, the website, and all the pain in the butt stuff that actually happens that makes all of this look so good. So thanks for coming out. Enjoy your night, and we'll see you bright at 10 o'clock tomorrow for Cali Blackwell's class, and we'll get started then. Thank you. Real quick, I'm getting something in my ear. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a missing cell phone, so if anybody in the campground comes across a cell phone, please bring it to Paratus Radio's tent, that's kind of our triage area, and we'll make sure it gets to the person who is missing it. I don't have a description that I'm aware of. Shiny and expensive, I don't know. Yeah, right. got this off. Right? I... <laughs>